Paul was a flight surgeon in the Air Force. Yes. He was an OBGYN medical doctor. He's delivered more than 4,000 babies. He's a U.S. congressman representing the 14th District of Texas, and he's running for president. And I'm pleased to be joined by his campaign's uh, communications director, Jesse Benton. Jesse, it's good to speak with you. Oh, thanks. It's a pleasure to be with you. Yeah. Uh, I noticed that there's a lot of politicians who will claim accolades uh, for throwing more money at the Department of Veterans Affairs. And, uh, of course, Veterans Day is going to be coming up here uh, in the not-too-distant future, and there's going to be a lot of grandstanding going on. And uh, I hear from almost every member of my congressional delegation, and I'm sure that uh, anybody who's listening today would probably hear the same thing from any uh, member of their congressional delegation as well, that veterans are underserved, and uh, so politicians will turn around and throw more money at uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs, yet at the same time that these politicians will say that veterans are underserved, they'll then turn around and appropriate more funds to sustain a war policy that is going to create yet more disabled veterans. Now, I don't know about you, but I see a paradox here, and I would like to get your reaction to, to that. Well, yeah, I, I, I think it's I think it's a very interesting point that uh, you know Ron Paul received more donations from active military service uh, 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 active people in the active military right now than uh, than any other Republican candidate running for president, and that's because people realize know that Ron Paul does support the troops. Ron Paul supports the troops more than any other Republican that says we need to continue this international adventurism. Ron Paul wants to bring troops home. Uh, Keep them safe. Get them out of a civil war where there are uh, people in, you know, from both two sides of a civil war shooting, and U.S. troops are in the middle. He wants to bring them home so we can secure our borders, have a stronger national defense, and you're right, not create more, uh, more, 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 uh, more disabled veterans, not uh, not see more more of our brave men and women killed. And that's that's why people. That's why that's why so many people in the active military support Ron. Yeah, uh, I agree, and uh, unfortunately, uh, you know that. Some of the big so-called veterans organizations, of course, uh, they were chartered by Congress, and so they tend to be uh, a part of uh, the government's amen corner, but uh, they tend to conflate supporting veterans with, with simply throwing more money at the, at the VA. And uh, so Congressman Ron Paul doesn't exactly get graded on the basis that he's opposed to the war, unlike the establishment Republican and Democrat uh, candidates. And to me, that's something that I want to see changed, because uh, you're absolutely right. I, I don't see any uh, better way to support uh, those serving the military, as well as veterans, than by ending uh, this un unconstitutional uh, war going on in Iraq. Uh, as I pointed out, there's a paradox in uh, uh, recognizing that veterans are underserved, yet at the same time uh, sustaining a policy that's going to create even more disabled veterans, you know. I guess it would be a lot like uh, uh, setting up a fire relief uh, program for victims of house fires while at the same time sending around a team of arsonists to burn people's homes down. But, um, uh, and speaking of the Department of Veterans Affairs, uh, another issue that I followed very uh, carefully, and I'd like to get the campaign uh, uh, response to this, uh, uh, the anthrax vaccine issue, i.e. The, the whole issue of compulsory vaccinations, uh, I have followed the, this issue very carefully. And one thing I found to be kind of uh, funny, Jesse, is back in the 90s, I was on active duty in the Marine Corps in the 90s under Bill Clinton. And it was shortly before I got out when the anthrax vaccine immunization program was first inaugurated by the, by the Clinton administration. And uh, the only opponents uh, of the compulsory program were a few Republicans. You had Dan Burton, Republican from Indiana, uh, Christopher Shays, Republican from Connecticut, uh, Walter Jones, Republican from North Carolina, and then, of course, uh, the late uh, and honorable uh, Jack Medcalf, Republican from the state of Washington. And uh, it was those four individuals that did more to fight for those who were serving in the military against uh, mandatory anthrax vaccinations than anybody else. And I noticed that uh, Congressman Ron Paul Paul, of course, supported uh, them in their efforts. He uh, would co-sign their letters, which is something I appreciate. But what I find to be funny here, Jesse, is you fast forward a couple years later to a Republican uh, being in the White House, i.e. George Bush, now that he's running the administration. Uh, I'm accused of being a left-wing liberal for opposing the same policy, i.e. the anthrax vaccine immunization program, that you're considered a right-wing conservative for opposing 
back in the late 90s while Clinton was president. So you see, as long as a Democrat is doing it, uh, you're considered conservative for opposing it. But then when a Republican does it, you're called a liberal for opposing the same thing. You know, a Republican does it, it's called uh, conservative. Uh, so I thought I'd share that with you. So I, I really learned how fraudulent the political paradigm is. Now, Congressman Ron Paul, he's not a Johnny-come-lately. You know, he didn't just uh, discover conservative uh, convictions. He was uh, standing up with people like Jack Metcalf back in the 1990s against the anthrax vaccination uh, immunization program or a mandatory vaccine. And I know today, uh, I'm sure he would have the same exact position. He hasn't switched just because there's a Republican in the White House. Uh, I'd like to get your reaction to that. Sure. Well, uh, just to touch on a few things that you brought up. Uh, well, you may or may not know, but our campaign manager here, Lou Moore, was Jack Metcalf's chief of staff. And Walter Jones is one of Ron Paul's best friends in the House of Representatives. So uh, you know, we, we very much draw from that line of thinking and are very much connected, uh, have, have a very, very strong, very positive connections to both of those great individuals that you bring up. Um, bring up another interesting point about about how now uh, if you you, know, you speak out about this mandatory anthrax vaccination, you're, you're branded uh, some kind of left-wing liberal. And, uh, you know, that, that's very interesting. You know, and, and unfortunately, we have some neoconservatives that are, are running, uh, running messaging shops. You know, they're, they're, they, they've, they've infiltrated, uh, you know, some, some, some news organizations and outlets, and they've got, they've hold some very key positions in this, in this administration. And uh, neoconservatives are not conservatives. They are, they are left-wing liberals, really. They come from the, from the left-wing liberal branch of the Democratic Party, Stemming all the way back to Woodrow Wilson in in in, uh, in the policies that he brought in, and you know, uh, or surrounding World War One of making the world safe for democracy and uh, and things like that, and uh, you know these uh, you know these these neoconservatives. Uh, they're not conservatives. Like I said, they're liberals, and they believe in in a very interventionist foreign policy where we project our troops and spread our troops thin all across the globe at at the peril of our of our domestic security and at the peril of our troops. And at the same time, they believe in in big nanny state entitlement driven government. And so it doesn't surprise me one bit that they think that they can you know tell our troops that they need to go ahead and take uh, this anthrax back vaccination, which is what I understand very painful. Has a very very high level of very negative side effects and uh you know i gotta tell you if i if i was serving in the united states marine corps as, as you did i would not want that put in my body oh well, yeah uh, absolutely in fact i did get those shots and i've had health problems ever since and uh you know i've seen uh, the corruption in fact this was my political epiphany i went from being a uh, considered to be a conservative to a liberal, all because uh, you know we went from a Democrat to a Republican president. Uh, but uh, I've learned firsthand, and uh, this is another question I have for you. Then, uh, through my own experience, um, that government is definitely not a philanthropic institution. But unfortunately, although I do see an awakening, there are a lot of people who still. Uh, hold on to the belief, and they may not uh, say this uh, as explicitly as I say it, but they hold on to the belief that the government is a philanthropic uh, institution, that when politicians spend money, they are philanthropists, you know, like they're spending their own money. And so if you come out opposed to a government program, they will, of course, conflate that with being opposed to the supposed uh, goal the, the, that they're trying to achieve with the program, such as if you say, you know, I think we need to abolish the Department of Education, well, you must be against education, which of course can be further from the truth. Uh, so my question is, how do you answer critics who believe the government should be funding, uh, you know, the, you know, it should be funding everything that is funding right now? Well, you know, I think we see most of our answers. We can see most of our answers in the Constitution. Uh, you know, the, the Constitution was such a revolutionary document and was really just such a, one of the, probably the most amazing document ever constructed for the purpose of protecting liberty. And what the founders realized is that uh, government does best when it's, when, it's, when it's as local as possible and as small as possible. And when you start to make government large, the larger you make government and the, the, the bigger the scope that you give it and the more concentrated that you make it, uh, then, then the more flawed it's going to be and the more problems that you're going to have. So they specifically 
did not enumerate powers like education in the Constitution, saying that it's much better done if we do it on a local level, as individual, you know, as, as in, based on you know small localities, and so that parents and teachers and communities can be involved and make these kind of decisions. And you uh, you you have the the least amount of mistake and the most and and the, the most uh, the most likelihood that you can mitigate these mistakes that government is is you know inherently going to make by you know by by, by spreading things out by keeping things small and uh, you know minimizing bureaucracy and minimizing all, all these things that we see in the federal government right now so you know I would argue very strongly that uh, you know, the way the way to improve education is not to continue to kick up more and more money to the federal government to this big Leviathan in Washington that then turns around and wastes uh, wastes an extremely large amount of money and mandates all kinds of things that we don't need uh, testing and and uh, mandatory health screening and all kinds of things putting these expensive mandates spending all this money on their bureaucracy I mean that's robbing and pulling money out of the pockets of localities that they could be spending on their kids and uh, you know when we as soon as we start to realize that the better off we're going to be yeah, and I think uh, probably a good way to uh, understand the difference between the free market and the state, i.e. the government, is of course the government does not earn uh, its money. It does not earn its income. It uses, of course, compulsory taxation. And uh, so this is why problems tend to inherit with everything the government gets involved with because it doesn't have to sit there and satisfy uh, consumer demands to obtain its revenue. Whereas on the free market, the only way to obtain uh, revenue, the only way to obtain uh, income is to satisfy consumer demands. Yeah, you make a great point. Uh, you know, the, the government creates nothing. The government has nothing except for what it takes from the people. And, uh, you know, you know, you know human, 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 all human endeavors are best, are best advanced through, through cooperation. But the government, government takes things from us through force. You, you must turn over a certain portion of your income or you will go to jail. I mean, that's forceful coercion. And things are so much better done if we can do things through, 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 through cooperation. And cooperation occurs best through the market. That's not to say that we don't need a strong military and a strong national defense to protect ourselves, to protect our, you know, our country and, our, and, our, and ourselves. But, again, cooperation is best. Government does not cooperate. Government, government takes things through force and through coercion. And that's, that, that's not how things are best, are best put forward. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I'm sorry if this is too easy uh, for you. <laughs> but uh, the other uh, question I have for you, I noticed that... Uh, one thing that uh, certain Republicans have tried to do is uh, create the perception, uh, as erroneous as it is, but they've tried to create the perception in people's minds that because Congressman Ron Paul is different than a lot of other Republicans, that he's the liberal, that he's the outsider, he's in the wrong party. Now, I find this to be kind of breathtaking because, you know, if you were to look at the voting records of most of these other Republicans and juxtapose them with, say, a Hillary Clinton or a Barack Obama, you're probably going to find a much more uh, striking uh, resemblance between their voting records than you would between, say, Congressman Ron Paul and Hillary Clinton. You look at, for example, war funding. Hillary Clinton has voted for every single war funding bill since, since she's been in the Senate. Uh, Barack Obama, uh, same thing. Uh, so they voted. They vote for all the war funding bills. You know, they voted for things like the Patriot Act, as did all the Republicans. Congressman Ron Paul, on the other hand, is actually different from Hillary Clinton, unlike the rest of the Republicans. So I'm thinking to myself, maybe it's the other Republicans that are in the wrong party. What do you have to say to that one? You know, I I don't know if they're in the wrong party or not, but I know that they uh, are. They do not vote and behave consistently with you know the 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 traditional platform of the Republican Party and even the the current platform of the Republican Party. I mean, the current public uh, platform of the Republican Party talks about limited government. Uh, you know about about you know cutting spending things like that. You know, if if you look back in in 2000 was the first time that the uh, the Republican Party removed from their official platform, abolishing the Department of Education. So uh, that, that was part of the official platform of the Republican Party eight years ago. And now you have a, a, con a Republican Congress and a Republican president that voted for the largest expansion of the Department of Education and no child left behind. And then he had the Medicare... Uh, Medicare the Part D, yeah. absolutely. I the think trillion dollar expansion of, of the Medicare entitlement. I mean, they're, they're on a spending orgy and... Uh, you know, it's people like Congressman Ron Paul, the only that represent the 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 only 
roadblock to this medicinizing uh, government, um, which leads me, I guess, to my next question. I get, I'm sorry, but these questions I have, these are some of the biggest things that I've always wanted to sit down and talk to the campaign about here. Uh, the whole issue of taxation, uh, one thing that I find to be kind of frustrating when I'm watching a, a debate between a Republican and a Democrat on television, of course the media, uh, the, the lovely media has to sterilize all the issues, you know, they wouldn't want people too intelligent, they won't be able to be able to discern too much here, and uh, I've noticed that the parlance of both sides of the discussion over taxing and spending tends to reinforce uh, you know, reinforce statism. You have the Republicans that on the one hand uh, claim accolades for these so-called Bush tax cuts and say, oh, the economy is just fine. And if you disagree that the economy, is, is, that we're in utopia, uh, even if you're in favor of free markets, then you must be a liberal because, of course, they have reduced conservatism down to Bush worship. So they will sit there, they'll claim accolades for Bush cutting taxes and say the economy is fine. Then you have the Democrats, who I believe rightfully recognize that there is a problem uh, uh, with the economy, that uh, there's something that's amiss, that not everything is perfect. But then, of course, they blame it on uh, these supposed tax cuts. And to me, if we're going to believe that the economy is just uh, sailing along and everything is going swimmingly with the government as big as it is, really you're not making a very compelling case for the free market. Uh, so you have these Republicans that believe there's been tax cuts when there ha haven't. Then you have the Democrats that blame everything that's bad on these supposed tax cuts. Then you have a guy like me comes along and says, wait a minute, maybe we haven't really had tax cuts, but we do need them. And maybe that's why we have this problem, and I'm rejected by both sides. The Republicans falsely accuse me of you know, supporting big government. But here's the, what I really wanted to, to bring up here and what I wanted to ask you about. And the reason why I want to, want to get into this is because I believe that this is probably a key issue that Congressman Ron Paul should be appealing to Republicans. If you're a Republican in favor of tax cuts, Ron Paul is your only only guy. And that is because the congressman understands that inflation is a tax. Good way to put it is there's no objective difference between the government taking the money you have in your pocket and the government duplicating the money you have in your pocket, consequently devaluing what you have. Of course, we feel this with higher prices. Now, to finance a spending orgy, the government just prints money like crazy. And, of course, we feel this with higher prices, a tax, a stealth tax. And so what I see here is politicians who have tr tricked people by playing around with certain particular taxes. You know, they cut maybe one tax rate. But overall, the tax burden has gone up. And then they call this a tax cut. Now, if the only person that I see running for president that favors a true objective tax cut in terms of cutting the overall tax burden in abstract is Congressman Ron Paul because of this issue alone. What do you have to say about that? You know, uh, I think you're hitting it right on the head. You know, we can't uh, really... We, we, can't, uh, we can't really solve our problems until we solve our monetary policy problems. I was just in the supermarket yesterday buying, a, buying, buying something, and uh, I, I, I no longer drink milk due to, due to a, a little lactose intolerance. I'm sure you wanted to hear about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, a woman in front of me was, was buying a, a gallon of milk, and it was, it was $4. Uh, and I was sitting there, wow, the last time I bought milk, about six years ago, it was two sixty. And milk is an example of a market that's in pretty close to perfect competition, meaning that there's not very much price variance. Uh, you know, across, you know, across, you know, you buy a gallon of milk one place, it's going to be pretty much the same price within pennies of any place else you buy. Mm -hmm. So, gosh, you can just see right there how prices have really risen, and that is just due to our our monetary policy. The way that we we we, we the government has manipulated the way that they calculate the rate of inflation. They changed the way that they calculate the consumer price index in the 80s, and then again they changed it around 1996 to manipulate it so it looks like it's less. Um, you know, the, if, you, if you calculate the rate of inflation that we're currently experiencing right now, the way that they calculated in the 70s, 80s, 60s, you know, throughout, you know, th throughout, you know, recent economic history, we're currently experiencing around 12% inflation every year. 
And, uh, you know, we're told that it's, no, 2.5%, 3%, but it's not. You know, it's 25 3% if you don't count uh, energy, housing, or food, and then some other things. And uh, the last time I checked, just about every American uses energy, housing, and food uh, quite regularly on a, on a regular basis. And, uh, you know, if, if, you also, if we also understand the way that inflation works, people that get the money first, when, when it's created, Wall Street, uh, big business, military, industrial complex, the way things are set up right now, they get the money first when it's first printed before prices have had a chance to rise. So they don't experience the inflation. It's good for them to have more money printed. But then, you know, uh, you know uh, Joe Main Street in, in middle America, you know, he gets the money after it's already been spent. So he is hit with inflation much, much worse than people that get the money first. So, you know, Ron argues that, uh, you know, an average middle class or lower class American citizen could really be seeing 15% inflation right now, and that is a, that is a detrimental tax. And that is why, even though there is so much good economic news going on, and there still are some positive things going on in our, going on in our economy, that uh, you know, the middle class and the lower middle class feel a real pinch right now and why they see their standard of living actually shrinking, uh, mm-hmm. even though everything is supposed to be so great right now. So if we, don't, if we don't get our arms around this, if we don't firm up our currency, fix our broken monetary policy, stop creating, stop creating money out of thin air, then we are going to see a, a shrink in the middle class and expansion of poverty. Yeah, and... Uh of course, there's the price of gold, which, of course, you know, gold is the real barometer of the dollar, and you don't have a rise in uh, the price of gold the way it has uh, risen over just like the last six years, unless there's some serious devaluation of the currency going on. Uh, what, in the year 2001, gold was about 270-something an ounce, and had been stagnating at that price for quite some time. Now, uh, we're looking at uh, you know, almost $700 an ounce, about six. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I would humbly suggest uh, to you, uh, sir, that uh, even the old way of calculating uh, prices was, of course, uh, not correct, and I'm sure we don't have to argue on that point, but here's what my take uh, on that is. Uh, like, you look at the CPI, for example, uh, it, it captures the transaction price of a good, you know, the amount you pay for a good. But, you know, a lot of goods, a lot of industries receive taxpayer subsidies, like you were talking about milk, and you have a lot of agricultural subsidies. Now, if you walk into a car dealership and, uh, say, pay $15,000 for a car, and the dealer mugs you for another $15,000, how much did you really pay? You paid about $30,000, right? Yeah. Now, if the government is subsidizing uh, or you look at Walmart, which receives, uh, I believe, billi- it's in the billions uh, through things like tax increment financing at the local level and so on and so forth. Uh, that means that what, what you pay in the store isn't the total amount you're really paying. That's not the uh, full amount paid. Uh, that's a subsidized price, right? Yep. Now, the CPI can't possibly capture this because, of course, the government conveniently takes the whole cost of government and puts it into things like the GNP. Uh, you know, and keep, uh, so pursuant to the government's method, you, know, you look at roads. You know, in a narrow sense, it seems free to drive on the roads. You know, you, I can get in my car, go out on the road. I don't have to pay anybody. But they weren't free. The government paid for it. The CPI can't capture. It doesn't capture the, the cost of government. And so... I think what this is getting into is the fact that as soon as the government intervenes in the marketplace, no longer is the price structure left intact, and so we're using a price structure that is not intact to try to measure and gauge inflation based upon uh, non-intact prices. Uh, you see what I'm saying here? No, you, you make a, you make a good point. Uh, you know, really, really, what 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 the, the the real value of our money and how it's shrinking is is very very difficult to calculate and. Uh, um, Looking at how it relates to the price of gold is 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 a, definitely another way, and uh, you, you just demonstrated right there that uh, if if you use that as a barometer, then you know our money has 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 two thirds of our two thirds of the value of our money has dissipated in seven years. Yes, and uh, anyway, I would say it's not. I would say that it's probably not that extreme, but uh, you you can make that argument, and it at least very points and illustrates a very very shock disturbing trend. Yeah, I know I can windbag, I can talk a lot. I apologize for that, but is there anything in closing that you would like to add? Uh, I guess I would just like for, for, your, for your veterans out there, um, you know, Ron is not the kind of guy that uh, 
Uh, he, 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 sometimes I don't think he, he takes enough credit because he doesn't like the grandstand and uh, he doesn't like to feel like he's exploiting. He's very people. humble. He is very, he's a very humble man. But uh, if you're talking about someone who takes care of veterans, no one takes care of veterans better than Ron Paul. He's consistently recognized for that. Consistently gets and mail from around the country uh, saying, you know, I, I, you know, I can't get the services that I need from the VA. My rep won't help. Can you help? And he helps everybody outside of this district that he can. And he makes sure that everyone, every single veteran inside his district gets everything that they're entitled to. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it doesn't surprise me you have a, a man like Congressman Ron Paul uh, who understands the, the problems that inherit with the state and is not afraid to take on bureaucracy, whereas you have these other politicians. In fact, you know, uh, and I won't name the, this uh, particular senator. He passed away anyway. But uh, his former, the person who handled veterans' casework, and, and I bring this up because I think this crystallizes the problem here. The person who handled veterans' casework, and I noticed that none of my issues would ever get resolved or addressed, right? But the person that handled veterans' casework, actually, uh, after the senator passed away, this person that handled veterans' casework ended up working for the director of the VA. Now, that's a pretty... Uh, made a pretty smooth transition from the senator's office straight into the VA bureaucracy. Now, evidently, there's some kind of a tight relationship going on between a lot of these uh, congressional offices and the bureaucracy, and you're really not going to get help in a situation like that. Yeah, I know, and uh, this is what I plan on devoting my time to, pointing out the reasons why Congressman Ron Paul should appeal to veterans and those serving in the military. And uh, I am absolutely with you 110%. I want to say that uh, I think more and more, and of, uh, more, and more of us uh, excuse me, are realizing that uh, there's a lot of uh, corruption, rampant corruption, uh, within the government, including the VA. In fact, you look at all these executives that sat on the boards that uh, voted people bonuses. They voted themselves a bunch of bonuses. <laughs> you know, it's like like the government, when the government has a power to, to, to literally print money, when uh, bureaucrats have the power to give themselves a paycheck, you know, license to, to, to virtually create money, of course they're going to abuse this power. And I think we see this more and more. And uh, government that's accountable to nobody. Uh, you know, VA that, uh, uh, in fact, I'm noticing it's almost like uh, even the VA has gone super top secret now. You know, it's like you can't find out the names of people who are doing things and that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, it's just absolutely incredible. And so I just wanted to, to add that. I want to say that, uh, you know, Congressman Ron Paul is definitely the man that veterans should be supporting. And speaking of uh, the Congressman's humility, I just wanted to add this. I will never forget during his first debate, his first Republican debate, uh, when he spoke about the issue of habeas corpus, and he said that he would never abuse habeas corpus. And of course, a lot of people underestimate the significance of this in terms of uh, working as a firewall to protect uh, liberty against tyranny. You know, the, the whole idea that the government can come grab us and whisk us away uh, without uh, getting a chance to face your accusers, uh, examine and confront uh, evidence, and so on and so forth, it's just absolutely breathtaking. I mean, habeas corpus, the bedrock of uh, liberty. And when I saw Congressman Ron Paul say that he would not abuse habeas corpus, you know what I was seeing? I was seeing a man who really loves this country and its, inhabit, uh, its uh, inhabitants. Like he, he has a lot of concern, uh, a, a, a lot of uh, compassion in his heart. He, he, he wants to help this country. He wants to help people. He, and he sees what's going on. He sees the injustice. And that's what I'm seeing, Jesse. I wanted to, to add that, I guess. Well, thank you. And thank you for your support. Yeah, no problem. You, you're absolutely welcome. And uh, now the website is www.ronpaul2008.com. Yes, it is. And I'm sorry if I spoke more than you. <laughs> no problem at all. I think we, I think it was about equal. But uh, I appreciate you spending time with me today, and uh, I will do my part to get veterans to support you. We all need to support Congressman Ron Paul. That's how, that's how we're going to win by everyone out there doing their part. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir.